Hi, my name is Ankur, Technical Marketing Engineer at Cisco Systems. Today we will be talking about new high availability architecture that is APSSO which got introduced in 7.3 release. Let's have a quick overview of agenda, what we will be covering in this video today. We'll do a quick recap of current high availability that is a high availability without APSSO. We'll see a true high availability which got introduced in 7.3 release that is APSSO. We'll see the high availability connectivity and different interfaces which got introduced in high availability. Pairing and different states of transition in high availability. Failover process. We'll see how the configurations can be done for high availability. And then upgrading the WLC in HA pair. This is one of the most important sections because once the WLC is in HA pair, we need to understand how we can do the upgrade for both the controllers. And finally, the AP SSO with legacy high availability. So let's do a quick recap. Primary, secondary, tertiary WLC. So if you see in today's high availability, which is without AP SSO, we configure primary, secondary and tertiary controller on all the APs. So for an example, if you have 500 APs, you need to configure primary, secondary, tertiary controller IP and system name on each and every AP. We also have a configuration of primary and secondary backup. Each WLC configured separately and have their own unique IP address. Failover detection, AP goes into discovery state, start the discovery process and go into a joint phase again. Downtime between failover may go up to one and a half minute depending upon number of APs in the network. All APs, all the controllers need to be in the same mobility domain to have primary, secondary and tertiary concept. And each WLC can be managed separately by NCS. Now let's see what we are getting new in high availability as an AP SSO. So what we are getting as uh, AP SSO is box to box high availability that is 1 is to 1. 1 WLC will be always be in active state and second will be in a standby state continuously monitoring the active controller via redundant port. We'll talk about redundant port in the next couple of slides. The most important part configuration on active is synced to the standby controller. So now you don't need to configure each and every controller individually. Both the WLCs share the same set of configuration including the management IP address. And again a very important part which brings the clear differentiation between the AP SSO and the old high availability that the AP's CAPFAP state is synced on an active and standby controller. So now AP does not go into discovery state and maintains its joint state on failover. Downtime between failover reduced to 5 to 100,000 milliseconds. So basically it's a sub-second failover in case of box failover and 3 seconds in case of network failover. It's supported on 5500, 7500, 85 and Wisdom 2 controller. So let's see uh, high availability connectivity and the different interfaces which are introduced for high availability and AP SSO interaction. So if you see uh, this is a 5500 controller, we have a redundant ports. Both the redundant ports should be connected back to back to achieve an high availability AP SSO. They have a dedicated redundancy port which can be used to sync the configuration from active to standby controller. So now no need to configure two controllers individually. The configuration automatically gets synced. The key payloads are sent on an RP port from standby to active controller every 100 milliseconds which is a default timer. Both the controllers also send an ICMP message to the gateway to check the gateway reachability. So in that way they know that the network is up or not. The same way 7500 also have the redundant port and 8500 too. Now let's see how within 2 we can achieve AP SSO. In within 2 controllers we have something called as redundancy VLAN which is used to sync the configuration from active to standby WLC. Again key payloads are sent on redundancy VLAN instead of redundancy port from standby to active controller every 100 milliseconds. To achieve the HA between the VISM2 WLCs in two different chassis, you can have a VSL which is a VSS setup. You can also have in a single chassis. And again the ICMP messages are sent to the gateway to check the gateway reachability. If you see the configuration wise, the way we used to configure the service VLAN, same way we have to configure a redundancy VLAN which is 169 in this example. We have to make sure that there is no data flowing in VLAN 169, it is dedicatedly used for 
redundancy in VLAN. So let's see what all interfaces are introduced to have an APSSO interaction. If you see uh, from 7.2 to 7.3 we get a new interface which is called as redundancy management interface. A redundancy management interface is used to check the gateway reachability and it's also used to check the peer reachability. Notification to the standby in an event of failover, this interface is also used. Communication with the syslog, NTP, TFTP server also uses this interface. The most important point, redundancy management interface should be in the same subnet as management interface. So if you see a screenshot, we have the redundancy management interface in 9.6.61 subnet and the management also is in 9.6.61 subnet. So another important port which is redundancy port. If you see a screen capture, we have something called as redundancy port. This is one of the most important port which is not introduced for APSSO and is very important for the high availability interaction. It is used to sync the configuration from active to standby controller, a bulk configuration when the controller is booting or an incremental configuration in runtime. It also gets an auto-generated IP address, so no need to configure specifically this interface. Once the controller boots, whatever IP is being configured on your redundant management interface, last two octets are taken and the first two octets is 169.254. If NTP is not configured, a manual time is also synced using this interface. Also in case of a box failover, a notification message is sent using this interface to tell the standby to take over the network. Now let's see how the pairing works in different states of transition in high availability. So high availability pairing how the pairing works, so when both the controllers boots up, we have to make sure that they are in the same type of hardware and software version. A mismatch may result in maintenance mode. So if you have a 5500 controller, you need to have a 5500 controller as a standby controller. If you boot two controllers as 55 and 75 after configuring HA, they may go into a maintenance mode. We'll talk about maintenance mode in next slide. Now HA pairing only happens when WLC is booting. It's not an automatic detection process. A reboot of WLC is required once HA is enabled. So once you configure an HA, we have to reboot the controller so that they can form a pairing and the configuration can be synced. Because there could be possibility that before enabling HA, the configurations are not synced. While booting, WLCs try to discover each other and they try to form a pair. They wait for approximately 120 seconds, which is a default timer and can be changed using a redundant management interface and redundant port. So when the controller boots up, they try to check that whether they can reach each other via the redundant port or they can reach each other via the redundant management interface. So it takes 120 seconds to discover each other and start the config sync. Once the discovery happens, they start syncing all the configurations to the standby controller via redundant port. So if you see in the screen capture, they have already discovered and now they are going for the configuration sync. So now no need to configure two controllers independently. All the configuration can get synced from active to standby controller. Most important point, while config is getting synced from active to standby controller or standby controller is booting, no configuration is possible on an active controller. This restriction has been imposed because there could be a possibility that the standby controller is still booting up and detecting a pair and config is getting synced and somebody is configuring on the active controller which may not get synced. So it is very important to restrict the configuration till both the controllers are up. Active and standby decision is not an automated procedure. We have to manually define who is an active controller and who is a standby controller. A standby controller is decided based on an HASKU. This will be available from 7.3 release. An end user can order a controller with an HASKU which comes with a zero AP license and it will always be a standby controller. For an exi existing WLC which gets upgraded from 7.2 to 7.3 release, it can be configured using a configuration. No configuration is possible on standby controller. So standby controller is just waiting to take over the network and you cannot configure anything on the standby controller. So if you give a question mark on a prompt, you will not see any option to configure any configuration on the standby controller. Different states of transition in high availability. So, when the controller is booting and we have already configured in high availability, 
On an active controller, if we issue a command show redundancy summary, we see an output that fear state. The fear state is a state of my controller which is still booting. It shows it's in progress to standby code. This is a state where Active WLC had already discovered a standby controller and the configuration is syncing. Then the standby controller moves to a state called as standby cold. This is a state where config had already synced and the configuration is getting initialized and the controller is continue booting. And finally at the end you will see a standby hot state. If you issue a command show redundancy summary on your active controller, you will see a local state is active and a peer state is standby hot. If you put a console on your standby controller, you will see a dash standby prom automatically added in front of the prom. And the peer state is active and the local state is standby hot. So most important point, maintenance mode. So this is a mode where the controller may go in case if it is not able to discover my active controller. So non-reachability to the gateway via redundant management interface may also result in going in a maintenance mode or a redundant port is down. So if you issue a command show redundancy summary, you will see that the local state is negotiation and peer state is disabled and maintenance mode automatically get enabled. This is a case where your RP port or our RP cable may go bad and because of which I may not be able to sync the configuration. At that time, I cannot keep this controller up. So it goes into a maintenance mode. WLC should be rebooted to bring it out of the maintenance mode. It automatically never comes out of maintenance mode because the WLC does not know what was the problem in the network and if the problem has been resolved or not. Only console and service port is available in maintenance and standby mode. If your controller is in a standby mode, you cannot telnet or SSH to the management or dynamic interface. You have to have a console or the service port to access the standby controller. And there is no web access available on a service port when HA is enabled. So as I mentioned in my last slide, a dash standby prompt is automatically added in front of the controller prompt. This gives a clear indication that the controller is my standby controller. So let's see the failover process because this is the process which is in, not in control of anybody. There could be a problem with an RP port, there could be a problem with the box or there could be a problem with the power. So APs, uh, which is one of the most important uh, point in AP SSO, APs CAPF state is maintained on active as well as standby WLC. So if you see a previous high availability where we configure a primary, secondary and tertiary, the AP always join on one controller and once controller goes down, it goes and discover and goes and join second controller. But in AP SSO, if I see the two controllers, which is in active and standby, the AP states are maintained on both the controllers. The AP's up times are also maintained on both the controllers. So if AP is up for 5 days, you will see an AP up for a 5 days on a standby controller also. Now let's see a failover process. Failover in HA can be categorized as a box failover or a network failover. In a box failover can occur due to a software crash or a software hang or a manual reset or a forced switch over. In that case, an active immediately sends a command to the standby controller via an RP port and a redundant management interface to tell to take over the network. A failover time will vary from 5 to 500 milliseconds. Again, it's a sub-second and a box failover can occur due to also power failure. There could be possibility that the active controller goes down because all of a sudden it lost the power. In that case, the failover time will vary from 325 2000 milliseconds. A network failover is a condition where my active controller is not able to reach the gateway. There could be a possibility that a cable to the switch goes down and I'm not able to reach the gateway. In that case, it takes three to four seconds to detect that the network has gone down and it tells the standby to take over. The client SSO is not supported in 7.3 release because of which the client database cannot get synced. APSSO will de off the client. So whenever the APSSO triggers and active controller goes down and standby takes over the network, the client will get deauthenticated and comes up as a new client. But the SSIDs will always be on. So AP will never stop advertising 
the SSIDs. So it's always on SSID when the APSSO get triggers. So again, how can we configure a high availability, which is a new feature called as APSSO? So let's see how we can configure this from a GUI. So by default, it is disabled. And configure an APSSO, it's just a three configuration and a three steps. So first we need to configure a redundant management IP and a peer redundant management IP. Redundant management IP, as we discussed in our previous slides, it's a parallel interface as a management. We need to configure this IP which belongs to me and then I need to configure a peer IP which belongs to my standby. And vice versa need to be done on another controller which we intend to be a standby controller. The next stage is to define who is my primary controller and who is my secondary controller. And then just enable an APSSO. In these three steps, the controller can be formed a pair and active can take over the network and standby will keep monitoring the network. Once done, it will get we have to reset the controller to bring the current to bring the high availability. Once APSSO is up on the same page under controller and global configuration for redundancy, you can configure different optional parameters like a keep a life timer or a peer search timer or a service port IP and the peer service port IP. Because once it forms a pair, you cannot configure anything on the standby controller. So if you want to change your service port IP, you can configure from an active controller a peer service port IP and a mask. And it automatically gets synced via redundant port. So upgrading a controller in an HA pair. So once the two controllers are up, we have to find out how can we do an upgrade. A standby WLC cannot be upgraded directly from the TFTP and FTP server. A standby WLC has the same IP as management interface and as we know, only one IP can be active in a network if it's same IP. So standby WLC cannot directly talk to the network. An active WLC, after executing all the scripts, transfer the entire image bundle to the standby controller. So the way we upgrade a normal controller, we have to follow the same procedure. It's just that once the active controller downloads an image, execute all the scripts, transfer the entire bundle to the standby controller, and standby controller start executing the scripts. All the logs of the image transfer can be seen on an active controller. So if you see an output capture, which is from the CLI of an active controller, we see that the TFTP file transfer is successful on an active controller, which is as of today. And then the transferring file is done to the standby controller. And then you see the standby is executing all the scripts to get itself upgraded. Once the standby gets upgraded, it just prompts you a message that successful upgrade on the standby controller and then we can reboot the controllers to boot up with a new image. So no need to worry about how the standby controllers can be upgraded or we do, you don't need to upgrade all the controllers individually. Just upgrade the active controller, it will take care of upgrading the standby controller. Some of the most important points which we should keep in mind before upgrading. A scheduled reset applies to both the controllers. So if you do a scheduled reset and define that what time the controller should be rebooted, it gets synced to both the controllers and the standby reboots just one minute before the scheduled time. It is very important to have both the controllers rebooted at the same time because if you don't reboot both the controllers at the same time, one controller will come up with a different image and try to discover and see that there is an image version mismatch and will go into a maintenance mode. So make sure that once the upgrade is done, either we do a scheduled reset, which will take care of automatically rebooting both the controllers, or we reboot the controllers at the same time. A debug transfer can be enabled on active as well as the standby controller. So in case if you want to debug the upgrades and see that what's going on, we can still enable the debugs on both the controller. And we need to have the peer in a hot standby state. So if your peer is not in a hot standby state, upgrade cannot be done. If your peer is in still a transition state, only active can be upgraded and the image will not be pushed to the standby controller. So make sure that the hot standby state is done and then only the upgrade is started. So now let's talk of uh, APSSO, how it interacts with the legacy high availability. So if you see this network topology, I have a 
primary data center cloud where I have two controllers working in a primary controller and as a hot standby controller and it's connected via a redundant port. There's a network infrastructure switch, all the APs are connected and I have a secondary and tertiary controller. All the APs have joined and made a CAF tunnel on a primary WLC which will automatically get synced to the standby controller. So now in this case, my primary data center, the CAFF state is maintained on primary as well as the standby controller. And then I can go to each and every AP and configure who is my secondary controller and who is my tertiary controller. In case if something happens to my primary controller, my APs will go to the standby controller because they are already maintained. The CAFF state is already synced to this. So the downtime is less than a second. In case if both the controllers fail and the complete primary data center goes down, the AP will fall back to the legacy high availability and will go to the secondary controller, followed to the tertiary controller if the secondary controller goes down. So it is very important that to understand if your primary controller goes down, AP will never go and fall back to the legacy high availability. It will still go to your standby controller and the downtime is less than a second. If you see your AP database, the primary WLC is configured as 9.6.61.2 which is again the primary controller and both have the same IP so I no need to worry about configuring the primary controller individually on all the controllers. And then a secondary controller and a tertiary controller can be configured on each and every AP. Thank you and have a good day.